So continuing the theme of open access, I'm going to be um, talking more around the transition and how we, um, Spring of Nature is supporting the transition and how we're enabling the transition within the business. Um, very briefly, we've heard um, ASDA, we've heard um, Mr. Mehmet Mirat talk about open science and open access and why it's so important, but I'll just touch on that very briefly. Um, what we're doing with open access, how we're kind of trying to lead the way there, what our strategy is, um, transformative agreements and their role in the transition as this really is a key aspect for us in terms of transitioning our business. Transformative agreements really do play a major role there. And then to finish off, we're going to do some myth busting. So looking at some of those really common misconceptions amongst authors, amongst institutions, um, you know, around open access um, and some um, Busting there, but also give some um, kind of solutions in, in how we can tackle those um, and, you know, really ensure that that, um, that information is, is shared accurately. So open science and open access. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this. I'm sure everyone's, you know, really, really aware. You know, it's it, open science is so important in terms of creating a faster and more effective research system sustainably and at scale. And this is through, you know, enabling the use and reuse of research, um, speeding up um, that's those scientific advances. It fosters collaboration between disciplines at a global level. Um, and then, of course, building an equitable research landscape is very important. So by opening up research, you're ensuring that everybody has that same opportunity to access science. Um, with, it protects and enhances research integrity. And ultimately, it looks to work towards solving the world's um, greatest challenges. Um, and so, you know, we know that the benefits within the research system are an increase in um, downloads and an increase in citations of articles. I've said before, it enables the reproducibility and increases trust in research, makes global research open, and it enables and improves interdisciplinary research. So we're not just talking about making the article open here, we're talking about all of those other pieces that are linked to the article, so the data, the open codes, open protocols, and enabling that, um, that, that sharing. But it goes beyond academia, um, you know, and it supports real world application of research. We see increases in media and social media of mentions of research, which um, kind of enable that um, engagement with people outside of, of um, the research system. Um, it makes research accessible to companies, startups, and, you know, it can, um, can enable boosting the e economic growth. Um, it makes publicly funded research accessible, which is so important as well. Um, and ultimately, it democratizes, so it really levels out the playing field and allows access to research outcomes for everyone. And there has been research done in a direct research done um, between us and, and the Dutch consortia, where we looked at what the um, the benefits to society that they could link back to having made their research open access over the last 10 years. So what are we doing um, at Spring and H? We heard a little bit from Asda on this. Um, so we have Spring of Nature is an amalgamation of various publishers that came together. Um, and all of them came with very strong open access kind of ethos from BMC to Nature to Springer. Um, and today we um, have published over 1.25 million research articles, gold open access. We have a variety of, of portfolios supporting open access ours is with 600 journals in our fully OA portfolio. We've published 3,000 open access books um, and we have over 2,700 journals in the hybrid portfolio. Um, nearly half of um, our SDG sustainable development goal related articles um, are published open access. 
um, which is so important that we're able to make that open and, and um, we're looking you know, to always increase that, that proportion being made openly available. Um, we support over 2.5 million authors to publish OA. Um, and we are always looking and, and pioneering new and more, um, more democratic routes to open access. So an example is transformative agreements, but we are always looking at other models that, that need, to, depending on the needs of, of different researchers and needs of different stakeholders and, you know, very much keeping an open mind there. So, you know, there was a, a question around subscribe to open and all of these different models. And this is something that we pay very close attention to. Um, and are always open to to innovating on that. Um, within Spring and Nature, we've done a lot of research to really try and you know have a strong thought leadership piece, if you like, to really try and um, use the proof points to support open access and the transition. So we know that um, OA. Um, articles receive 1.6 times more citations and 50% more citations for books, um, 2.5 times more outmetric attention, 10 times more outmetric attention for books. Um, when we look at the general, um, you know, I mean, this is, this is a benefit for authors, but equally it's a benefit for institutions. It's a benefit for, for countries to have more of their articles downloaded, but also to be able to access more as well as more, um, you know, outside of, of um, outside of agreements or outside of your own agreement, um, being able to access more open access articles from elsewhere. Um, and I mentioned, you know, the, the society and science piece. Um, so, you know, the SDG related that 50% of the content is now published open access. Um, but overall, um, we've had nearly 3 billion um, content downloads on our open access content. Um, so Asda touched on this as well. And, you know, we've um, been very open in that we are now um, on the road to transform our business and we are proactively doing this. This is a key, our key strategy. Um, and by the end of this year, 50% of our research content will be published open access. Um, and I'm relieved to say that we are on track to achieve that, um, all looking very well. And, and then um, in the, the coming year or so, we will be able to um, look at what our next goal will be and continue um, with that proactivity. So we're achieving this through four main routes. Um, so continuing to focus on gold open access. So we have always been very, very clear that we um, believe that gold OA is the most sustainable route to open access. And that is a route that, that um, we are taking the business in. Um, investing in our fully open access portfolio um, we invest in all our portfolios, but obviously for the, the sake of, of talking about open access, continuing to invest in our, um, in our open access portfolios. And um, this is through continued investment into our infrastructure, in the technical investment to ensure that our platforms are now um, able to, to better serve our authors in an open access world, better able to serve our institutions in an open access world. Um, innovating to ensure equity and open access. So we are very aware that, um, you know, there is there are challenges in, um, in um, everyone being able to, to come on board and, and publish open access. So we're looking at our different initiatives. And then the key part of our, our strategy and the way that we're really going to see an impact in, in the transition of, of Spring and Nature is through transitioning our hybrid portfolio and that done through transformative agreements. So looking at the gold OA, um, so in 2022, we saw a 15% increase in downloads of our open access content, um, and that was 146 million more from 2021 and 2022, very much down to um, an increase in articles in our fully open access portfolio, but a huge increase in transformative agreements coming on in the last few years, therefore an increase in open access content being published. We see the highest increase in downloads 
from the lower income countries and lower middle income countries. So it's really sort of demonstrating um, the positive impact that uh, making this um, research open is having in terms of, um, of, of providing um, science globally. 29% of that increase was in Asia and 11% in Africa. Um, and I mentioned our, our um, numbers in terms of 1.25 million OA articles and 154,000 of those were published in 2022. Um, looking at the fully OA portfolio, you know, it's ultimately um, the future as well. So we have 600 titles there. Um, they are, um, we have the top three downloaded fully OA journals, scientific reports, Nature Communications, BMC Public Health. Um, we publish scientific reports published um, over 22,000 articles, um, publishes around 22,000 articles a year. So really, really, a, you know, a, a very, very big journal. Um, we have represented over 200 countries by our authors. Um, and we have a waiver program within the fully open access portfolio. So um, any author that's in financial need um, can apply for a waiver. And in 2022, we waived 20 million euros in open access journal fees within the portfolio. Um, in terms of, of the, the quality, if you like, of the journals, um, we see, um, we've seen a 10% increase in, in downloads, um, but authors publishing in, in, the, in those journals um, have benefited from the highest average citation per article and the highest number of accumulated citations um, when comparing to other fully open access um, publishers. So on the topic of equity, so it is a key part of our, our strategy to really kind of work with the industry, work with partners um, on how we can provide equitable solutions to open access. I mentioned already our waiver program on the fully OA portfolio. Then of course, it's the TA expansion. So a TA in itself is providing an equitable solution to authors in terms of, um, in terms of giving them the opportunity to publish open access. Um, but also, you know, our TA expansion globally, you know, different regions have different needs, are in different situations. And so we are evolving and adapting um, our transformative agreement so that we can meet the needs and, um, and enable um, a transition in, in the different parts of the world. We also recently launched um, a tiered pricing pilot. Um, and this is on our BMC portfolio and the, um, uh, the, what the, um, the APC is priced specifically for that region. Um, the aim is to make it, um, to make OA publishing more accessible to all the authors, regardless of their location. So effectively different regions um, receive different, um, a different discount automatically on the APC. Um, we have new, we're looking at new business models. Um, one of those is our new curious journals. So the um, curious um journal the, the first one was a medical journal it's now launching in in different disciplines and this is in these are peer-reviewed open access journals um, which don't have an apc so the author publishes for free what um provided the article um is um edited is typeset um is um language the language um is up to the standard of the journal it will be published for free otherwise the author can pay a small fee to have their their article um edited and this has been you know a, an effective way to offer um, an open access route for authors that don't necessarily have the funding. Um, we publish a number of fully sponsored open access journals, so Diamond OA journals, um, mostly sponsored by societies, um, some are sponsored by institutions, and these enable authors to publish OA free of charge. These are published under our fully OA portfolio. And then lastly, the Nature Fund, um, so as 
we know the nature research articles um, or nature research in our hybrid journals, they do have a, a high APC. Um, and the Nature Fund was set up to enable um, authors from lower income and lower middle income countries that are accepted for publication to be able to publish their article open access in those hybrid journals. So nature and the nature research. Um, and then sort of finally, the, the biggest piece of, of our transition, of course, is transforming our hybrid portfolio. Um, and we will be doing that through, or the, where we're seeing the biggest impact is through transformative agreements. So um, the transformative agreements published three times more Gold OA articles in Springer Hybrid journals. Um, than authors that were coming individually to publish open access, so paying for individual APCs. So we see that um, the TAs really bring three times as much more OA con to content than, than individual authors. Um, and the increase in agreements, as I mentioned before, really has led to, um, to OA content increasing. And we saw, we've seen that increase by nearly 40% since 2017. Um, as well as that, what we have seen on the um, humanities and social sciences side is the, the disciplines which aren't as well funded, generally speaking, globally, compared to life sciences or medicine, um, is the HSS. Um, and 90% of HSS open access content is published under a transformative agreement. Um, so though authors in those disciplines really do benefit from this because otherwise they may not have the funding to be able to, to support their, um, their publications to be funded away and, and would be left behind a paywall. So, you know, the, the TOs really provided that equity across the disciplines. So TAs, more, more on TAs and their role in the transition. Um, so I think you're all, you know, very aware and, and um, I know it's already been mentioned today, so I won't spend too long on, on this, but transform, what are transformative agreements? They're essentially a type of open access agreement that combines publishing um, in hybrid journals with access to the subscription content in those journals. And it combines it in one single agreement and one single payment so that the costs of accessing and the costs of publishing are in, in one. Um, and why were they created? They were created as a path um, for, uh, to provide a path to, to the open access transition um, and allow institutions to be able to, to transition their authors and remove that financial burden from the author um, themselves. So the benefits are, of course, you know, as we've heard, maximizing access, TAs, um, cover open access. So, you know, you, publishing open access brings, brings more, um, um, provides more access, but also the subscription side by um, by providing um, access to everything behind the paywall within the transformative agreement, you're also providing access to that content, which um, some institutions may not have, have had before. Um, flexible budget, so TAs um, enable centrally um, negotiated and controlled costs. It's time efficient. Um, so one of maybe the only downside of open access publishing is it does come with admin. It comes with admin, it comes with many micro payments if you're looking at individual APCs. Um, it's very hard for institutions, for countries to get good oversight of what's being published, what's being paid and, and TAs um, bring that together and, and they um, provide set time saving, they um, relieve some of that administrative burden from both authors and institutions as well. Um, it's equitable, you know, I've, I've already talked about that, you're providing a service for all authors with an institution regardless of what funding they're receiving. Um, and I've already spoken about the, the controlled aspect, it allows um, institutions and consortia to be able to manage the transition um, in, in a way that they can. Um, 
So, yeah, I've already kind of touched on this and you've seen um, spoken about those, the, the increase in citations, not metric attention for authors. Um, but I think it's really um, important to, to kind of continue to highlight the other benefits in terms of removing that financial burden from, from authors and having them concentrate on what's important, publishing their research and not how they can try and get it published open access where they might be able to, uh, you know, um, dealing with the administration behind that. Regardless, you know, it's that some authors have um, more funding than others because of their discipline, etc. Um, it gives more um, opportunity to younger researchers as well who may not have the same level of funding. Um, and equally, you know, it does maximize um, institutional impact. It allows the institution to provide more access to their authors. Um, but it, it also relieves the burden from the institution. They, the institution also really gets a good oversight of, of their author's activity, you know, how much they're publishing, where they're publishing, you know, and that previously was really a, a, a real a struggle to, to challenge, to, to overcome, even for the publishers themselves, to really identify um, publishing from, from institutions before we had, you know, adapted our systems to open access. Um, and, you know, it provides an equitable transition to OA. Um, again, I, I talked about some of those stats on the left there, but I think it's important to also highlight again that, that you know, it, there is still a lot of um, content behind the paywall and transformative agreements don't just allow authors to be able to publish their work open access, but to be able to um, to access the, the, the content that's still being published subscription. Um, of the articles that are being published open access um, by, I mean, as to touched on this before, by um, authors under a transformative agreement, we see that it's about 70% of the usage of those open access articles is coming from anonymous users. So you could argue that had those articles been published um, subscription, they would only have had 30% of the accesses they're currently getting now. Um, and it's not just Springer Nature um, or Wiley who are um, embracing the TAs and, and, and you know, seeing TAs as the best and, uh, way and the proven way to transition globally. Um, what this shows us is um, how much transformative agreements have grown in the industry and across all publishers from um, 2014 to 2023. And really we started to see some pickup in, in 2018. We launched our first one in 2015, but it was, you know, it took a few years for, for this to, to gain some momentum. 2018, um, there were 34 agreements in nine countries um, and only 14 publishers um, were, were um, working with TAs. In 2023, we now see over 850 agreements in over 70 countries and over 60 um, publishers are now, um, are now signing um, transformative agreements. So this really is kind of mainstream and we're starting to see that transition um, happen. Um, so in terms of... TAs transitioning um, our portfolio. So the way that they're driving this is through um, delivering the increased choice, providing a bespoke approach, depending on the needs of the institution, the consortia, the regional needs. Um, it allows the reuse of existing spend um, and any flexibility to bring in other funding streams. And I think Turkey is a great example of that in terms of um, looking at, at um, what we could achieve now and, and the plans to grow that agreement as well. Um, and of course, it gives institutions the opportunity to increase visibility. Um, this is from 2022. We are still waiting for um, 2023 um, data, but what this shows is um, the proportion of open access content from countries with a TA prior to their agreement, and that's what you see in the orange. 
um, compared to um, the proportion being published open access after the TA was in place. Um, so you can see big increases before and after a, a TA was, was in place. There are some um, countries like Italy and Spain um, where the um, agreement was lower coverage, um, much like Turkey, slightly lower coverage. Um, so you see that proportion is, is slightly less um, as with Ireland as well. And of course, then you see the US, which really stands out. You know, the US is, is um, a huge country, huge publishing output, um, but they are really in their early stages of transitioning and transformative agreements. So when we, I think but by the end of this year, when we redo this graph for next year, where we've seen more transformative agreements launch in the US in the last two years, then we'll start to see that proportion shifting slightly. Um, but yes, yeah. Um, yeah, and just a, a overview of where we have um, our agreements and where we um, have our first agreement. So we had the first one with California, the first one in, in Africa with Egypt, in Latin America, and our largest agreement in, in Japan. And all of these agreements are different. They're all, um, they've all adapted to the, the needs and the requirements in those regions. Those consortia, um, um, the consortia themselves are managed very differently and we've had to adapt to, to those. Um, there's, it's really true that there's no one size fits all. Um, and here I wanted to show um, the, the, the growth in, in our agreement. So in 2018, we had six agreements. Um, we were publishing less than 10,000 articles. And you can see that it was very much Northern Europe, that green patch up there. Um, this year, we um, have now have over 50 agreements. We're publishing over 50,000 open access articles under those transformative agreements. And the spread is global now, you know, um, most of Europe is covered. You can see um, Turkey and Greece there, um, Turkey and Egypt, sorry. And then what we've um, launched most recently, as well as, as Turkey launching this year, were a number of agreements in East Asia as well. So we're starting to see activity there. China is still taking some time because of some of the challenges that ASDA mentioned, um, but certainly in South Korea and Japan. Um, also in, in the US, you can see some of those dots in there, um, some of the, the consortial agreements that we, we had launched there. So um, just to finish off on the transformative agreement um, piece, and, and Lean will be talking much more about about this um, in her presentation. But, you know, one of the, the main reasons for, for partnering with Spring and Nature for the transition to open access is because of the flexibility that, um, that, that has made our agreements possible and made our agreements effective around the world. Um, our experience, so, you know, we're coming up to 10 years since we launched our first transformative agreement. Those agreements have, um, continued, they have evolved, they've changed, we've had many, many new ones come on board. Um, the support of, of our partners, so we like to think that we support from the very beginning through conversations, right through to that support once the agreement is launched, um, again, which Lean will give much more, um, much more info on. Um, and of course, the reach, you know, in terms of um, the, our articles are cited on average um, 6.6 times, which is more than any of any other publisher. So moving on to myth busting, we wanted to, to touch on some of the, the most common misconceptions about open access um, and see if we could counter those. So the first one, open access is just a publishing trend. It's not a trend anymore. It's very firmly um, mainstream now. And I think we have seen that by some of the 
um, agreements that um, some of the the um, some of what I've talked about today in terms of the increase in articles and, and agreements, and I think you know in the past twenty years, um, major funders, governments, and institutions have mandated open access publishing. Um, and we've, as I mentioned, have published over 1.25 million open access articles. 50% of our research articles will be OA by 2025. And, you know, a, a, a number of other publishers have also, you know, staked their, their ambitions in transitioning themselves um, to open access. It's not just a, a spring and nature thing. It's not just a trend. This is the way that, that um, research publishing is is heading um, so we know the advantages of um, making research open um, however we have although we have seen um, a lot of progress the take up by the research community has still been slow um, we know that researchers um, are often poorly informed on the benefits of OA and are still reliant on impact factor um, and the way that their you know, research is rewarded, research is measured, um, has a, a real impact on, on authors um, choosing open access or understanding the benefits there. The transition is still complex. Um, you know, we talked about the, the, the change in um, going from a consumer to a producer. So, for example, Europe publishes most open access content. Asia is the biggest user of that content, but the funding in those places um, differs slightly and, and legacy subscriptions men. So it can be a challenge to transition this. Um, and of course, developing equitable and sustainable OA options does remain a challenge and something that um, all stakeholders um, are working together in, within the industry to, to try and combat. Um, and this is just a graph to show the increase in open access policies from research organizations, from funders. Um, and you can see from 2005 to 2022 that um, it's increased rapidly, but within that, the, um, the mandates and the policies are evolving and they're changing all the time. Um, you know, some are becoming much stricter. Um, for example, you know, you, you have Plan S, for example, which is very extreme. Um, but on the whole, you know, we can see that, that this is the, the move that, that funders are taking. Number two, open access is expensive and the fees are too high. So APCs are based on costs associated with the journal. So the cost um, in managing the review process, certifying, enhancing, amplifying um, research is real. Um, and you know, even rejected articles have to go through um, some kind of process um, in terms of the review process, and they still require manpower um, and it's timely and, and staff intensive. Um, different journals have different um, levels in terms of the amount of work that goes into them. So an example would be the Nature Research Portfolio to publish in, you know, a Nature Journal has 280 in-house PhD level educated independent editors. They, um, you know, spend so much time reviewing this article. It goes through a huge amount of, of, of work and um, the review process is very long. Um, but then you have other journals where the peer review may be done externally, managed by degree level educated staff, um, as well as peer reviewers, of course. So the costs associated with that journal might be less. And you can really see that an, an example would be looking at um, a, a comparison with nature and then scientific reports, for example. So scientific reports has a much lower APC than a nature journal because of that, the different um, levels of, of work that goes into it. Um, so the time spent on reviewing does vary, but ultimately um, we can't ever compromise on the editorial and ethical um, standards of the journal. So there are always costs associated with that. Um, also, as I mentioned, we do offer waivers to authors from um, who are in financial need. 
Um, and this is just, you know, a, a very quick overview of, of the publishing process and, you know, why it takes um, as long as it takes, because we read and process every submitted article and we separate commercial and editorial interests. So I think that's very important to note that um, an editor doesn't know, it, for example, if a, an article is submitted to a hybrid journal, an editor doesn't know whether that article is going to be published open access or it's going to be published subscription. They're just working on um, on the merit of that, that article itself. Um, so, you know, the answer is we try and be as fast as possible, but without risking the scientific integrity. OA means author pays, so the quality is not ensured. Editorial standards, I say do not differ at all. They absolutely should not differ at all. So reputable publishers ensure articles are only accepted on editorial and research merit across all publishing models, um, according, of course, to the aims and scope of the journal, as I just mentioned. So really, it, we, you know, it's important to maintain the quantity over quality aspect here. However, um, predatory publishers are a real issue for authors. They're a real issue for the transition itself. Um, and so as an industry, we um, need to work, you know, together to try and um, help authors understand, um, you know, the difference between predatory publishing and, and, and publishing open access with, with reputable publishers. And there are tools and resources available to support authors um, with the challenge. Um, at Spring Nature, we um, have a, a dedicated department that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time, um, which really focuses on research integrity and um, plays a really big role in the industry to, to tackle the issues there. So in terms of, um, of the, some of the resources that are available, um, so we know that... Um, that predatory um, journals will specifically go after um, authors um, because in the short term, they, they want the, the volume of those articles. Um, and what we recommend is um, a resource called Think, Check, Submit, which you may be already very familiar with. Um, and that really provides authors with resources and tools um, so that they can really be thinking about choosing the right journal, checking whether that journal, how to check whether that journal is indeed a, um, a reputable quality journal, um, ethical journal, um, before they submit to it. Um, and then in terms of, of some of the um, work that we're doing, we have um, an ongoing research project to understand integrity related training needs of researchers across the globe. Um, and we know that some of the um, research integrity issues are also evolving as publishing is evolving um, with the use of, of AI, for example. On the other side of that, we are also using AI to tackle the problem of research integrity um, and to develop techn technological solutions um, to avert attempts to manipulate the publication record, for example. <clears throat> and then the collaboration and leadership. So we play a very strong role within the research community um, and um, we're establishing and developing the, the STM Integrity Hub. Um, to, which is an initiative to protect research integrity. Number four, OA means free articles. This is otherwise known as bronze OA. So we have green OA, we have gold OA, we have diamond OA, and then we also have bronze OA. So this is when articles are made free to read, <clears throat> but they're not strictly open access. So they are free to read on the publisher page. Um, however, they lack a license that guarantees long-term accessibility, the CC BY license. Um, and they're often delayed 
as well in maybe after a certain period after publication or they're only available for a limited duration so this may be a, a way to promote the article to promote a collection or a certain um, research topic at that time and the really key thing here is that bronze away or, or free articles um, because they're not published cc by um, it's not um, it's the, the version of record is not being shared and built upon. So it's not possible for authors to, or readers to be able to access um, connecting, um, connecting um, research to that article, like the data, etc. cetera. Um, and then number five, green open access provides a path to open access. So we believe that green open access is actually slowing down the transition. Um, it pollutes the scientific rep record and it doesn't enable open science. Gold OA offers the simplest, most open and most sustainable route to OA um, and open science. So for example, um, some comparisons here in terms of timing, you know, publishing an article gold open access is um, it means it's available immediately on publication green OA it means it's available after generally after an embargo period the version and this is the really important piece the final published version of record uh, under gold OA um, is after any copy editing and typesetting um, with green OA it's usually the author's accepted manuscript after peer review, but before copy editing and typesetting that's made available. Location and discoverability, the article is freely available and easily discoverable on the publisher's platform alongside other relevant content. Um, under Green OA, it's generally made av available somewhere other than the publisher's website, whether repositories um, or often the author's own homepage. Um, and the integrity of the scientific record. So the version of record is up to date and linked to any post-publication corrections. So it ensures clear and constant accurate scientific record. Um, green away, you can end up with various versions over time. You know, um, it's not necessarily citable or fully connected to other papers um, and may not be updated with, cor with corrections. So it sort of ri risks polluting the scientific record. Record. Licensing, the open license CC BY allows users to build, adapt, and share. Um, obviously, green rights and reuse may be limited. Path to open science. As I've said before, it's it really opens, it's this open science piece. It can be bi-directionally linked to open data sets and protocols. Um, as well as included in open metrics um, and comply with open standards. Um, the article, the author's accepted manuscript under Green OA is not easily integrated into the, the um, open science research system. Um, and then finally, and I think this is the most important piece when we think about transitioning as a whole, is that gold open access the publishing infrastructure is funded via APCs and transformative agreements, which is making the transition to a fully open access world possible. Um, under the green away, it will always be reliant on subscriptions, on the existence of subscriptions to fund it. Um, and so we can't see that a transition to a fully OA system is, is possible. Um, and then just finally, I just wanted to take this from um, uh, some studies that we've done, a research paper. So um, this white paper shows that researchers overwhelmingly prefer the article version of record for reading and for citing um, compared to the accepted manuscript um, or the preprint. Um, so you can see there the differences in those are, are significant. Um, yeah, and I think that was me. That was quicker before time. Um, are we saving questions till yes, the end? Uh, yes, yeah, okay. Some questions. Maybe you can stay with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we have some. So thank you so much, Natal, Miss Natalia, for the session. I trust everyone found it enlightening. Uh, it um, raised um, more kind of awareness.
what we were talking about. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask Natalia. She's here to answer them. Or maybe, um, or maybe we would like to hear like how your institution is experiencing the, the misconceptions Natalia talked about. Any volunteer? Yes. Yes, Marvin, please. Hi, Natalia. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is more about actually CCY license. As you mentioned, you said uh, it's one of the key concepts in open access. And as you know, there are different types of CC BY licenses. In your journals, is there any um, license type you predominantly prefer? And in that license, do you usually prefer to give the copyright to the author? Um, so we prefer CC BY, um, always have done and that gives the license to the author, of course. We are now, because of the, the rise of, of AI, um, and in terms of trying to protect the, the author, the author's, um, the author's work, we are reviewing that as well. And so there's lots of discussions in the industry more generally about how they can support um, author's rights over their, their research in an AI environment. Um, but as default, um, uh, except there are a couple of, of journals with an exception of um, CC by NC, CC by ND. Um, but in general, our default license has always been CC by, but we are, you know, a part of those industry wide discussions about how, how sustainable that is for, for protecting authors rights going forward. Thank you. Merhabalar, Natalya sunumun için teşekkürler. Ben de açık erişim açısından bir soru yöneltmek istiyorum. Açık, pardon, açık lisansların kullanımı ile birlikte o dergilerin yazarları bu konuda sıkıntı yaşamıyordur ama öte yandan yapay zeka ile oluşturulmuş olan makalelerde bu korumayı nasıl bir yaklaşımla sağlıyorsunuz şifreler kapsamında ikinci bir sorun da yeşil yol açık erişimle ilgili yanlış yanlış değil de bilinen yaklaşımda bilgi kirliliğinin oluşması versiyonların olması açısından Altın yolu destekleyen bir e, yapı var. E, Şipringer'de anlattığınız kadarıyla. E, bu açıdan da baktığınızda yeşil yola destek vermeyen anlaşmalar mı, dönüşüm anlaşmaları öyle mi anlamalıyız? So um, for in answer to the, the first question around AI and, and how we're protecting, um, if I understand, is that linked to um, yeah, sort of the research integrity piece? Um, because there's a, yeah, there, there are, um, there's a lot going on in terms of um, the, um, what the team is doing to try and combat this. Um, we can give you more information on this. It's not my area of, of expertise on that, but um, there is a lot of work going on that we can provide more, more detailed information with you afterwards. In terms of the gold versus green under the transformative agreements, um, essentially, yes, the transformative agreements are supporting gold open access. Um, however, 
if you if if an article is published gold open access it can of course go into any repository be published on on any website it can be used provided it's um it's acknowledged appropriately um so yeah you know there's for us the the transformative agreements um are a gold open access and that's how we're enabling open access through the gold route Merhaba, ben de tebrik ederim sunumunuzu. Ben de misconceptions hakkında bölümüyle ilgili bir şey soracağım. Orada bronz open access ile ilgili not free to read dedik. Orayı ben tam anlayamadım yani not free to read derken sonuçta free to read değil mi aslında? Bunu soracaktım, teşekkürler. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, all open access is is free to read in a sense. But I think um, what Bronze OA is, um, if an article has been made available um, on the publisher website, but it hasn't actually been published open access under a CC BY license, it's just been opened up by the publisher um, for maybe a, a short amount of time. It might be that the they want to promote the article particularly, or they want to promote the collection or promote the, um, the research um, area at that time. Um, so it will more often than not be closed again. Um, so, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's not, it's not got long-term, uh, long-term open access, if you like. I would like to ask a question about the uh, time of the process of the article, because uh, you said that uh, you are evaluating all the articles the same way, but our researcher always saying that if I pay APC, my article will be uh, edited, will be uh, finished the process very quick. Otherwise, it will take more than eight months, nine months. Yeah. So, one of the reasons people would like to make open access to publication to publish quick. Yeah, and I think this is part of that kind of misconception as well that, um, if I can find it, um, you know, uh, the ah, anyway, I can't, I can't find it, but um, some publishers are publishing very quickly and that is very attractive to authors and we have seen that in the increase of, of articles being published um, but I think it goes back to my point about reputable publishers really you know um, their editorial standards and the way in which they're processing articles shouldn't change just because an, an um, a um, a, a journal is open access that absolutely shouldn't be the case however there are instances where um that that is the case and this is what's kind of polluting that um idea that publishing open access you will get published and you will get published really quickly really there should be no difference you know um and that's where the author really needs to understand where they're publishing you know and and what that means i mean um our fully open access portfolio it's you know some people would argue unfortunately not very quick <laughs> it could be quicker you know and that's um but that is you know um but back to this it's we do it as fast as possible but without risking the scientific integrity and robust processes you are right on the paper, it's true, but how can you give to me any, any evidence about that? About our papers? About your journal. There is a, such a uh, understanding, I don't know, which is just uh, for Turkish authors yeah. or not, I think for all over the world, because you explain 
as a uh, editorial processes yeah. also. But to uh, read of this misunderstanding, because you are mentioning these are equal processes. Yeah. There is no uh, any other differences between the processes. Yeah. Could you please send us through the ULAKBIM or through the institutions mm -hmm. some uh, criteria or items of the process, these yeah. editorial processes or something I think, then we can show, we can share with our authors? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is probably some already available actually from the editorial um, side, but we can certainly look into that to be able to really kind of show but it should be definitely mentioning there is no differences yeah. between the processes yeah absolutely not only explaining the open access processes just the differences. yeah yeah generally and and i think as well it's um this this website here um you, there is where authors can check their journal before they submit it, if they, if there are any doubts as well. Um, Predator journals process is completely different. Yes, Just yes. Gültekin is mentioning here, which some authors needs that really this process items. Yeah. Because you said either the articles is open access or regular subscription base or close ones and ah, same process that's why this right, editorial you, uh, processes uh, our authors need to see is there any differences between these two processes yeah. or not so so you mean specifically for the the springer uh, transformative agreement oh okay yeah, yeah sure that's very yeah that's really easy for us to pull together you know to make very clear there yeah, is no Natalia, no difference i can add one thing here ee, özellikle bizim şu anki sürecimiz yani bu açık erişim anlaşması ile ilgili geçirdiğimiz süreçte öncelikle yazarlar normal her zaman yaptığı gibi makalelerini editoryal kısma gönderiyor. Editoryal kısımdan onay alındıktan sonra kabul aldıktan sonra sisteme gidiyor ve sistem onlar yani tabi e, e, eğer TÜBİTAK kısmı olmasaydı da soruyordu siz bunu açık erişim mi yayınlamak istiyorsunuz subscription based biz de en azından bizim hibrit dergilerimiz için durum böyle o yüzden sizin söylediğiniz koşul bizde çok karşılaşılan bir şey değil maybe it's uh, changeable for the publisher to publisher but uh, for example one of the journal one of the publisher in Turkey Within one year, double the number of publication. How it can be possible? Because they, uh, we made a transform agreement with them, so we doubled our article and that job. With Springer? No. Oh. I mean, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, is it depends on on that publisher's, um, you know, the the standards the you know the way that they they're running their journals i guess it's hard for us to to kind of comment on that yeah i think there's a question at the back thank you for the presentation uh, my question is about the citations to open access papers you said that there, there is six percent more citations for the open access papers. Uh, is that analysis conducted over uh, fully open access journals, or does it also include the open access papers uh, in the hybrid journals? Yeah, it's it um, is across the board. So when we talk about our Gold OA journals at Spring of Nature, we mean journal, um, Gold OA articles, articles at Spring of Nature. We're talking about those published in the fully OA journals as well as those published in um, the hybrid journals. We can share with you the white paper, the, the publication that we did, which um, showed all of those, where we pulled out and identified all of those stats as well. Um, that's no problem. Any more? Uh, 
Bir de zaten genel olarak bu e, süreçlerle ilgili e, Lin zaten öğleden sonra bahsedecek ama biz her ay düzenli webinarlar yapıyoruz. Bu webinarlarda da yazarların izlemesi gereken yollar, karşılaşacakları şeyler ve aslında bazı bilinen yanlış durumların e, en azından bizim açımızdan nasıl olduğu ile ilgili açıklamalarda yapıyoruz. Bayağı güzel katılımlar oluyor. Onlarla ilgili de yine bilgiler vereceğiz ama bu yanlış bilinen, daha doğrusu doğru bilinen yanlışlarla ilgili bizler de bazı konuların altını sıklıkla çizmeye çalışıyoruz. Başka soru varsa yine alabiliriz. Şimdi dediniz ki demin yazar makaleyi gönderdiği noktada, ilk noktada yani sizin yayın başvuru platformunuzla karşılaştığı ilk noktada kendisine bunu açık erişim yapmak ister misin, istemez misin, fonum var mı yok mu sorusu çıkmıyor. You need a mic. Tekrar söylediğim gibi özellikle hibrit dergilerdeki süreç için konuşuyorum. Normal editorial süreç başlıyor. Editorial kabul aldıktan sonra e, TÜBİTAK anlaşmasından bağımsız, daha önce de böyle, yazara soruluyor. Açık erişim yayınlamak istersiniz, subscription based mi? Yazar bundan sonra seçimini yapıyor. E, yine Natalia, maybe you can, you know, uh, confirm me. E, but, ama normal açık erişim, full open access dergi nerede? Yazar zaten o makaleyi gönderirken tamamen açık erişim olduğunu ve bir APC ücreti, ödemesi gerektiğini biliyor. Ama bu APC ücretinin ödendiği durumlarda yayın daha hızlı yayınlanıyor. İşte daha öncelik veriliyor gibi bir durum. Yine söz konusu değil. Bizde tüm e, gelen yayınlar aynı şekilde değerlendiriliyor. Ha yayın sıklığına göre derginin ya da derginin genel performans durumuna göre, editoryal süreçlerine göre bu süre belki dergiden dergiye bile bazen değişebiliyor. <gülüyor> hani bunu netleştirmemiz gerekiyor tabii, tabii. ki Lütfen. bizim de okuyuculara doğru bilgiyi verebilmek için. Yani sunumdan benim anladığım kadarıyla ben bir yazar olarak submit ettiğim zaman paper'ı orada bu open mı, hibrit mi, e, değil mi ben bilmiyorum. Yazar hibrit olarak bilsem de için. ona değil. Ama biraz önce sanki o dergiler için dediniz de ilk cümleniz de onun için. Şimdi yani hibrite gittiği zaman zaten yok onu... zaten open access ise bir dergi. Yazar zaten oraya açık erişim Peki, olarak hibrit başvuru yapacak dergi, değil. Hibrit dergi ya da diğer dergiye gönderdiği zamanki proses aynı mı? Yani biz aynı editorial süre. Çünkü sunumda Aynı denildi. Aynı. Yani biz onun o, için bu sorular evet, sorulmak Herhangi bir ihtiyacı. hızlandırma, It's... herhangi bir şey e, ekstradan open access dergilerde daha hızlı bir süreç var gibi bir şey bizim tarafımızda söz konusu değil. Ama bu dergiden dergiye, editoryal süreçten editoryal süreci de değişiyor. Bazı derginin yayın sıklığı atıyorum 3 e, ayda bir oluyor, bazısının aylık oluyor. Değişebiliyor yayın sıklığına göre bile bu sıralama ve hız değişebiliyor. Eğer e, Natalia, maybe you can also answer, but e, eğer bir açık erişim dergi ise zaten bunu biliyor. Ama bir hibrit dergi ise e, yayınlama tercihini yazar sürecin sonunda yapıyor. X. Exactly, exactly. It's as Selena's been saying. So, I mean, I think it's it's not so much the author knowing, but it's the editorial teams behind knowing if an article is going to be published open access they don't know that in a hybrid journal they they're just um processing the article as they or this um manuscript as they would any other manuscript and it's only once it's been editorial accepted whether it there is an agreement in place or not all authors on hybrid journals are given the option to publish open access once their article is accepted Um, on the fully open access journals, 
you would assume that authors are aware that there is a fully a, that it is an open access journal that there is an APC cost associated with it when they submit, um, but there is no guarantee that those that their article is going to be accepted. That the um, that the process from publication from submission to publication is going to be any faster. Some are faster than others. It depends on. Um, the amount of, of review that might go into an article. It depends on that journal's processes. It very much varies, but, you know, uh, us, we have some very um, highly regarded fully OA journals that have very high rejection rate, Nature Communications, for example, M the EMBO journal, um, some of the, the BMC journals as well. Then we have others which have um, slightly lower um, or slightly higher acceptance rates. So it really, really does vary. And that's what um, I think is important. But provided that the process is ethical, that's what we really need to make clear to to authors, but you wouldn't see a change or any faster movement on your article um, going through the process based on open access. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, in the coming presentation, we will be speaking about the uh, operation that the author goes through, the process that they go through, and then when they get editorially accepted, then only they get to know that they are going, they have the choice to be able to publish open access. Before that, uh, they don't have the option to pick that. Also, the editor cannot, for a hybrid journal in specific, they cannot specify if the author is going to choose uh, open access or not. It only happens after the editorial acceptance. And in the coming presentation, I will show you what uh, processes we apply in order to make sure that this happens. It's a total different story for fully open access journals, just because it is a fully open access journals, yet the reasons are different for why there might be a faster uh, or an impression of a faster acceptance but we will go through the operations in the coming presentation of how the author can choose open access and apply for funding. And I, I think as well, it's worth mentioning, or even on the fully open access portfolio, you know, we waive a lot of articles, you know, we're not just processing articles to get the APC, we end up waiving a lot of, of those articles, which really sort of, you know, is a, a proof there um, for us here to, to see.